Raja Kannan Gopalakrishnan. He was working as a senior architect at Engineering Design Research Center L&T Construction, India's largest construction company. He's also worked on projects ranging from institutional buildings to international airports, apartment complexes to aircraft hangars. He's also attended 3 international conferences and 2 national conferences and has also presented technical papers at the Jawaharlal Nehru University Delhi and the MSRIT Bangalore he's also won the national championship at Archimen at the India's largest architecture quiz sir kannan gopalakrishnan currently runs a design firm habitat design studio and he is also a visiting faculty at the renowned architecture schools in tamil nadu Welcome back to UGC lecture series this is AR6502 history of architecture and culture 5 where in unit 3 you're dealing with modern architecture its development and its institutionalization where in lecture 26 wherein we saw de stil and bauhaus in the previous lecture de stil on one hand was an art form which was developed in netherlands which used only the primary colors straight lines which could only be horizontal or vertical and they could use the neutral colors such as black white and gray bauhaus a school of architecture as well as a school of thought which developed right after the period of de stil and it created enormous amount of influence on modern architecture as we know it so today we will be looking at someone who started bauhaus and someone who develop modern architecture by creating the school of architecture that is bauhaus that is none other than walter gropius so walter gropius he was a german architect he was the founder of bauhaus school like i mentioned earlier along with mies van der rohe le corbusier and frank lloyd wright he is widely recognized as one of the pioneering masters in modern architecture if you count the top 5 architects of all time in the world gropius is for sure to make it to that list so he is that important of an architect why he is important we will get to know about him in a little while so gropius did a lot of innovative designs he borrowed materials and construction methods from modern technology he was always in line with all the latest technological developments and his advocacy of building that is to become an industrialized building he carried with it with a belief that uh, team work is better than uh, in single individual work and he accepted standardization and prefabrication and embraced the advantages that standardization and prefabrication brings he uses technology as a basis of transforming a building into a science which is made of precise calculations what he does is he takes the latest technologies from the market which is available he incorporates them into his buildings thereby whatever function that the building has to perform is precisely performing the exact function which is intended to german engineering and architecture at its best gropius was not just a practitioner he was also a very very renowned theorist and a teacher it was gropius who introduced the concept of screen wall system a screen wall system for uh, people who don't know is using of a structural steel frame which supports the floors and there is external glass cladding to continue without any interruption on the external side you don't see any interruption between floor slabs and joints all you see is this big glass curtain wall and on the inside there will be a screen steel frame which will act as the structural member which will actually hold all the floors together it was gropius who introduced the screen wall system gropius has extensive facilities for the bauhaus at dessau he combined teaching students and faculty members housing auditorium and office spaces all together in one single campus he came up with an arrangement which is called the pinwheel configuration where 
from one point there will be four different radial configuration where each of the wings can represent a different function if you look at the whole building from the air from the top from a helicopter view it represents the form of a propeller of an airplane which are manufactured in the Dassault in that area that area is famous for manufacturing aircraft propellers so from aerial view the whole building will look like a propeller this Bauhaus building it embodies various technological and design oriented advancements in that particular period at that particular point of time glazing was very very new to the market and it was Gropius who introduced the whole concept of screen wall system and he created an architecture that became one with transparency he had supporting structure rising from behind the facing skin there was a facing skin and then there were structural members which are actually supporting the building and which is holding the building together and the facing skin has nothing to do with the su structural support this was a great achievement because from the outside from for the people who are looking at the building what he can tell us he can show the complete transparency of the building whatever that's happening on the inside is easily visible on the outside which means that transparency not just in the literal sense also in the metaphorical sense because sometimes you have to tell openly to people what you're doing and this exactly gave him the tools to be transparent with what he was doing it was a completely radical structure the structure was populated by a group of progressive minds starting a unique group of group oriented approach to learning like i said in the previous episode when we were doing Bauhaus school of architecture this is a place where a lot of people from different parts of europe had come in to teach and a lot of people in and around that area came to learn architecture and related arts the whole campus became a breeding ground for very very progressive minds during that era Bauhaus building provides an important landmark of architectural history even though it was dependent on earlier projects of the architect as well as on the basic outlines and concepts of Frank Lloyd Wright it consists of three connected wings or bridges There's one building over here and the other building over here there is school building here and the workshop building over here they are connected through a two-story bridge this bridge spans the road that comes from Dassault from the city when you want to enter Bauhaus you have to come through this road and you necessarily have to pass between this bridge on the bridge here on the lower level of the bridge all the admin areas were located all administrative works administrative offices were located on the lower bridge lower deck and on the upper deck was the private offices architects mayor and gropius had their personal offices over here on the upper level was the private office of two architects walter gropius and Adolf mayor which could be compared to the ship's captain command bridge during its location if you take a ship there is something called a command bridge which connects the panel areas and the engine areas of a ship there is one of the most important areas and a captain is always positioned at the command bridge so putting mayor and gropius on this place metaphorically means that they are the steering captains of the ship that's bahas the dormitories and the school buildings are connected through a wing where the assembly hall the dining room are located with a stage in between the basic structure of Bauhaus consists of a clear and carefully thought out system of connecting wings which correspond to internal operating system of the school there are different functions of the school interspaced at different locations often they are connected by buildings or spaces there are cafes or dining rooms gym rooms or auditoriums which clearly mark the beautiful circulation between the two spaces the technical construction of the building is demonstrated by the latest technological development of the dam 
a skeleton of reinforced concrete with brickwork. If you look at the screen here, this is the plan of the buildings. Like I said, there are two buildings over here. There is a school on to one side of the road and there is a workshop on the other side of the road. On the ground floor, this is the road that comes from Dessa. It passes through the two buildings and it goes like this. On the first and second floor, what you see is a bridge that is connecting the two wings, the workshop wing and the school wing. Here is the bridge showing the first floor plan which has all the administrative offices on the bridge. Again, workshops, shop areas and other activities on this side and teaching learning activities on the other side of the road. This is the site plan of overall Boha school. They had mushroom shaped ceilings on the lower level and they had all the roofs covered with asphalt tiles so that even on the roof people can actually walk upon. So that is added as another space where people can meet and talk and discuss architecture. The overall construction volume was more than 32,000 cubic meters and the total cost of the building amounted to more than 900,000 marks which was the currency of Germany at that particular point of time. Such an economical achievement was possible only due to the assistance of all the Bauhaus teachers and students which at the same time of course could be viewed as an ideal means of education because constructing a 32,500 cubic meters of volume in just 900,000 marks at that particular point of time was very very difficult. This kind of an economical architecture was possible only because they had enormous cooperation and coordination between the teachers and the students and a lot of people who were actually involved in the process. By that process itself, the overall education seems very blatant and apparent that it is a participatory school rather than an instructive kind of a school where teachers participate with the students, throw ideas over, kill ideas, make ideas, generate a lot of interesting and amazing possibilities out of the ideas, out of the discussions. And that is how an ideal school environment can be developed. And Bauhaus was the finest example of that. One of the finest outstanding achievements of the new constructional technique has been the abolition of the separating function of the wall. See, what usually happens is, walls are usually built as an element of support. In a brick built house or in a load bearing structure, what happens is, uh, the walls actually take the load which means the walls has to be really thick. The new concept which was developed by Bauhaus here is it's space saving construction which means all the load is transferred to a steel or concrete framework which is designed at specific intervals which eliminates the role of walls being acting as a load bearing structure. So the walls need not bear a load anymore. So the concept that walls have to be load bearing has been eliminated completely in this particular building which means that the only role of wall is to create mere screens between two spaces. If there is one classroom here, another classroom here, so we should not be able to hear what is happening in that classroom onto this. So that has become the only function of a wall here. And of course, on the outer side, you need a curtain wall or another kind of a wall, which means to keep out rain, cold, and noise of the exterior. So otherwise, on the interior, it was merely as a partition between two spaces. and a partly noise barrier, that is all. The walls need not take any load, which means that the walls could be ultra thin. The top floor rooms were extremely lightweight. Instead of pokey attics, which are darkened by uh, dormers and sloping ceilings with their uh, almost unutilizable corners in the sloping roofs, all those things were avoided. If you want to know what else was avoided, timber rafters were avoided because timber was the chief cause of fire, termites and uh, if there is a moisture attack then the whole building gets spoiled because of termites and other insect attack. Completely timber was avoided in the building. The possibility of turning the 
top of the house to a practical purpose you could have workshops discussions uh, in the top floor uh, you can convert it to a sun loggia an open air gymnasium or even a children's playground the top floor they made asphalt and it could actually be used if you had done a simple intervention there instead of removing the sloping roof which was the norm of the day because top floors usually had sloping roofs at that point of particular point of time in all the buildings so they removed the sloping roof which created unnecessary triangular spaces in the ends and the corner which was totally not utilizable so they removed the sloping roofs they made a flat roof there which meant which meant that all the rafters and uh, timber materials can be removed plus the top of the roofs can be used for some activity so it was a two or three mangoes from a single stone kind of an idea which was developed uh, in that particular building the structural provision was much simpler uh, because there could easily have been a lot of successful subsequent additions or deletions if they knew that they wanted to make an extra wing or if they want to make an extra story it was still possible if you had put a slope roof you have to remove the whole slope roof and then build another store now that there is a flat roof you can keep on building on top of that easily so these were the advantages of making one small design decision there this is the picture of the bridge which is connecting the school and the workshop on the opposite side over here here is the road that is coming from dasa look at the clean straight lines and also note the amount of opening that gropes and mayor have provided in the building so look at the amount of sun and light natural light that can enter to the building by providing clean open glass facade so that lot of what is happening inside the building is clearly visible from the outside totally increase the transparency here you can see that the administrative offices are all closed and there is uh, interior lighting which means that there is it's little late in the evening there are people still working in the classroom and there are people the heads of the institute are still working even after all the admin people have gone such a kind of an work environment was existing in bahas so what else did they do in this bahas they eliminated unnecessary surfaces uh, which presented itself for the act of wind and weather so all the surfaces which were unnecessary in a building everything was removed what you have is only the things that you really really need so all the hanging gutters were suppressed inside so there were no hanging gutters external drain pipes were uh, put inside all often what happens is if you make steel or chrome or any other type of external drain pipes they often get corroded or rusted easily and they also can get eroded easily because of the weather action so if the pipes are taken inside it's easy to maintain them let's take a look at another project which Gropius designed this is called the Fagus works this building was done by Gropius even though he did it along with the cooperation of Adolf Meyer and most of his early buildings have been in connection in cooperation with architect Adolf Meyer because he was his partner and a very good friend in his early career a Fagus factory was basically a shoe factory all right it was a shoe factory which manufactured shoe laces and in 1911 this building was supposed to be constructed like i explained in one of the earlier lectures that gropius mayer uh, mees and le corbusier they all studied under one great master who was called peter berens and peter berens designed an aeg turbine factory fagus works if you look at the architecture of aeg turbine factory designed by peter berens a few years ago and the fagus works factory which is designed by gropius and mayer they have enormous amount of similarity between the teacher the mentor and the the protege you have you can see enormous amount of significance between those two buildings you can see the same kind of architecture same kind of symbolism which both architects have in, introduced into this building 
So the starting point of this particular building, uh, there was an existing site plan which was designed by an architect called Edward Werner. So all the ground plan, uh, the construction plans were already there. Gropius was supposed to uh, work on those plans and make it better. That was the role that was given to Gropius. So American United Shoe Machinery Corporation gave a loan and uh, the construction started in 1911 and it was completed by 1912, step by step under the new concept which was given by Walter Gropius. Why is Fagus Works very important? Because it was a very important landmark building of early modern architecture. It was commissioned by the owner Carl Bernstedt who wanted to have a very, very unique structure that can um, say that the company no longer belongs to the past, the company belongs to the future. So he wanted to stay that and the building was a statement which was designed by Walter Gropius and Adolf Mayer. Even though the building was completed by 1912-1913, the interiors were not completed until 1925 because of the World War I which was reigning between 1914 and 18 and bad economical conditions during and after the World War. For the first time in the history of architecture, a complete facade is conceived in glass. The supporting piers are reduced to a narrow mullions of brick here. You can see that the supporting piers are very, very small, narrow mullions of brick here and there. And the corners are left without any support. There is no support for the corner. Usually, architects go, the, st the structural engineers will go mad if there is no support provided in the corner. But there is structural elements which are placed inside the building that can handle this kind of a load here. This unprecedented sense of openness in the whole building and there is continuity between the what is happening on the inside and the outside created a sense of dramatic change in how we look at architecture in that particular time period. This is how the other side of the factory looks. Here you can see the chimney and the uh, logo type of Fagus marked on the chimney. Here you can see the kinds of staircases and the details which Gropius has worked out for this building. And uh, there is another important quality here is that there are large expanses of clear glass which means the usual hard material that takes to separate interior and exterior is completely annihilated. So all the people can clearly know what is happening on the inside and the people inside can clearly have a look at the exterior. So a factory workspace which was totally confined to all the closed walls, they didn't have any access to visual uh, world outside was completely eliminated. Even the workers were happy to look at what is happening on the outside. Again like in the Bauhaus building, the expression of the flat roof has changed. There was only one building before which had the same kind of a feeling before which was the Steiner House in Vienna, which was designed by Adolf Loos. We studied Adolf Loos in our previous lectures, if you can remember the Steiner House which he designed. He had the very, very similar feeling of a pure cube which he had designed. Look at the sharp lines here. The corner doesn't have any support whatsoever. All the support that they have are these little brick mullions which they have. and. It provides a large amount of visual open spaces from the factory. The client wanted a very attractive facade which was solved by Gropius in the special way by means of a projected skeleton which uh, pulled the function of support to the inside and thereby making possible a uh, broad dissolution of the exterior envelope onto the glass walls. Uh, the idea of the curtain wall was at its first point expressed in a very consistent manner. Nowhere before was this amount of consistency possible in a curtain wall in earlier architecture. This was one of the sketches that Gropius had made for the building. You can see how close it is to the reality. The whole building construction procedure was newly thought out, which was perfectly in tandem with the inner functions and then it is articulated to the three-dimensional form. The next important building which Gropius designed as a house for himself at Lincoln, Massachusetts. It stands on uh, one of the very, very beautiful, interesting sites in New England. The site is beautiful. It, it is uh, the crest of a hill amidst 
an apple orchard which had more than 90 apple trees and the best part is it's only half an hour's drive from Harvard school where he used to teach to his house so from half an hour from his school he can reach this amazing spot you can see in the pictures here look how beautiful this spot is with more than 90 apple trees on a beautiful crest of a hill the Mrs. Taro was the uh, landlord of this area, landlady of the entire area and she left Gropius quite free to select okay you whatever site you want to take you can take and I can finance the building so this building fitted beautifully with the landscape at the same time overlooking all its beautiful surroundings the structure has the traditional light wood frame of New England and uh, it had a painted clapboard siding you can see the clapboard siding here in the picture usually the siding runs horizontally in all the buildings but here Gropius has made it look vertical that makes all the difference in the building you can see the clapboards which are made vertically over here here are some of the drawings of the building and you can see the interiors of the building uh, interiors pictures taken in two different seasons and here is a study room with modern furniture and you can see the amount of sun and a view that this particular room has same as with the fireplace sitting room look at the amount of openness that the building offers to the people who are staying inside with this we have come to almost an end of this episode where we will now quickly look at what we learned in this episode we understood the life and works of architect Walter Gropius we understood the early modern architecture of Walter Gropius and the Bauhaus School of Architecture and its evolution. We got to know the modern factory, uh, which is the Fagus works. We got to know how it worked and how it was designed. And we saw the beginning of modular philosophy in Gropius's works. With this, we should be able to answer the following questions which are going to appear on your screen right now. Write a brief about Walter Gropius's early life and career. Name a few famous works of Gropius, mark the similarity in these. Explain the architecture of Bauhaus School of Architecture and the advent of modernist concept with it. Explain Gropius's Fagus works with sketches. With this, we come to an end of this episode. I look forward to meeting you with interesting concepts on the other side of this episode. So, thank you.